social universe where you learn the secrets of the social media through the social universe and in many cases the secrets of the universe itself uh, one of the things that we're talking about today that is a true secret of the universe is how to remain alive how to remain healthy and to me there's two ways to be alive one is your heart is uh, beating your lungs are breathing the other one is to actually enjoy your life. There are some people who are, are dead, but they're alive. Um, and, uh, and if you can have both at the same time, that you can have a true love of life at the same time that you have a, a good, healthy life, that's the most amazing experience ever. I mean, I think there's a Tim McGraw song, you know, about, you know, live like you're dying. And if you can actually live like you're dying, but not be dying, that's the best way to live. And I'm not saying don't be, be short-sighted. You know, his song does talk a little bit more about, you know, fighting the Bull Manchu and, and Fu Manchu or whatever it was. And, uh, and um, that you, you can actually fit a long-term lifestyle in with an, a, a pathway where you truly enjoy that pathway. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a quote from my son, and then we're going to let uh, Meryl talk a little bit more um, uh, about uh, her her story and her experience. But my son went on the Iditarod uh, uh, um, uh, event over the weekend, and it, so it was a camp out. And, um, and he, you know, I grew up on a ranch as a cowboy, and so, you know, we slept in snow caves and all kinds of things. I mean, it wasn't just a matter of being a manly man. It was a matter of you, if you weren't a manly man, you were going to be dead. So um, it was a, a great experience growing up. Uh, high pain tolerance came along with that and the whole thing. So here I am raising uh, children in the city, and I'm getting him all prepared. Like, son, you know, you don't know what it's like to be in, you know, 5 to 10 degree weather, and you don't understand that, that you know, it's not it's not anymore are my shoes comfortable, it's do they keep my feet dry? <laughs> because they're so cold, when they get wet, then they freeze, and just all kinds of things. And he was like, dad, 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 it's going to be okay. So... Anyway, he went on this uh, on this trip, and he was well prepared because I over prepared him as a smothering parent, of course. And uh, and when he got there, he slept extremely warm, um, except for he didn't take my advice about the shoes. He wore the comfortable ones rather than the weather, the you know the the uh, ones that would keep the the wet out. And he did have cold feet. But the next day, um, you know, when he came home and shared it with me, it was a true rite of passage that, you know, they were dragging the sled around. They, they were like essentially the sled dogs for the, for the sled. And, um, and he talked about how hard it was, how he thought his lungs were going to burst. He thought his legs were going to fall right off and out of their joints and his, that, that all of his muscles were going to completely fall off his body. But he talked about how it was the most amazing fun he'd ever had and the most painful experience he'd ever had at the same time. That's what I'm talking about, about enjoying the pathway, that my son, for the first time in his life, learned that painful things can actually be enjoyed. Now, I'm not talking about being a sadist here, but I am talking about the, 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 the uh, vicissitudes of life, the, the things that are really, hey, that came from the dictionary right there, vicissitudes, <laughs> now and that. So um, anyway, uh, that he had a great experience doing things that are hard and loving the pathway, even if his, his muscles were burning. And so metaphor metaphorically speaking, even if our, our mind, body, and spirit muscles are all burning, we can actually go through life having a great experience. And Meryl's got some insight on that. Um, you know, at what point did, is it when you found, for those of you who are just tuning in, uh, Meryl is the the uh, owner of Holistic Health Innovation. Uh, she herself uh, um, was diagnosed with uh, a cancer um, and was able to turn down the chemotherapy that they were, you know, I wouldn't say rapidly, but adamantly advocating. Um, and uh, But they gave her some choices and she chose the, to uh, beat cancer through nutrition. So at what point was it that you decided, you know what, I'm A, uh, you know, that my, my metaphorically in my life, everything's burning, you know, I might not, might not even have a life here in the next little while. Um, and at what point did you decide, you know what, I'm going to do this, I did a rod, so to speak, your metaphorical I did a rod. Um, and just for a little um, sidebar here on uh -huh. the Iditarod, uh -huh. I w lived in Anchorage for two years. So oh my I gosh, you know the Iditarod. I know the Iditarod, but I didn't have any painful experience because I was on the, um, I was part of the spectators. Oh, okay, the but Iditarod. you still dressed warmly. I oh, think I, I do sure that. Did. <laughs> I sure did. So that's a spectacular 
uh, event. Yes, and I'll bet you wore shoes that you where you didn't get wet feet. Or um, not. Well, Did. let's put it this way. I lived in Alaska, I wore a fur coat, and now I'm a raw, vegan, um, plant-based nutrition <laughs> nutritionist, and I... Um, She's going to a I, lot of I, paradigm I really changes here. Huh? don't wear my fur coat that I wore in Alaska. <laughs> up there, it's pretty cold. It's a must up yeah, there, so yeah. So that's an incredible event. And mm -hmm. so your son actually... Um, Drove or was part of the team driving the uh, sleds? Oh, I've made him. I made it sound more impressive than it is. This was they, they kind of have little um, uh, state Iditarod. So each state oh. kind of has their winter Iditarod. Gotcha. So they went up to Flagstaff. All of, all of you who think that Arizona is just a a, a, a hot burning stove, um, we actually have uh, the, one the largest ponderosa pine stand in the world and. That means that there's ski resorts and there's there's uh, um, all kinds of cold weather and snow that go on up there. So yeah, they were up in the snow uh, pulling mm -hmm. your sled. So not as impressive mm -hmm. as going up to Alaska, but it was still pretty impressive. It was 10 degrees that yeah, night. Yeah, very impressive, very <laughs> impressive. Um, all right, so... Um, what was so question? okay, so yes. the, what was it? At what point did you did you put your Iditarod attitude on and say, you know what, I I don't care if everything about me is burning, I am going to beat this. Yes. Well, what I in order to come to a um, a decision whether to do the chemotherapy, I really did not want to um, stand on any philosophical principles that I would not do chemotherapy. I would not follow what the doctor recommended. Um, I wanted to come to a decision about which way to go alternatively um, or with the what they were recommending on my own. Something that really resonated with my spiritual commitment to myself. I really believe that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I have felt this way and I've um, been evolving in this philosophy for the last uh, 30 years. I guess that dates me a little bit, but I will <laughs> tell you I am 64 and I was 59 when I was uh, diagnosed with cancer. So I um, really put, just like you might uh, make any kind of decision where you draw a line down on the paper, the pros and the cons, and mm -hmm. I looked at, um, I did a lot of, I took my pathology report and I really uh, encouraged if anyone is faced with a, a serious illness and you do have a pathology report, uh, a lay person, such as myself, is not going to understand it, but you can understand it. You have the internet. I took every single um, word in that pathology report and I looked and researched it. And because I did that, I really saw what kind of studies were out there, what it was that I was dealing with, and uh, it, it, it brought me to a whole new level of awareness. So now I felt that I had an, I, a concept. I didn't have to be living in fear. Uh, yes, there was some anxiety doing all this research. Um, and an answer is not out there. The answer is inside of yourself. And that's the kind of a health coach uh, that I am, that I guide a person to uh, finding the answers that are right for them because that's really where healing originates. Mm -hmm. So when you have to do it for yourself and you're in this situation that I was in and I had to come up with some kind of credible argument one way or the other, I, I looked at all the pros and cons and I checked out the studies, the one that he gave me, and I found out something that he was not going to tell me is that the chemotherapy drug that they were going to give me was not specifically made for the type of cancer cell really? that I had. And I could only have found that out by actually doing the research on my pathology report. I would recommend all of you researching that. A couple of things. They, they have actually, this is, um, the, the Medical Association itself has, has done studies on its own self. And it took them a long time to release this information, but there are millions of people that have been diagnosed with cancer, they don't even have cancer. And it kind of answers a lot of questions for me that, uh, that cancer is so hard to beat, 
But have you heard? If you started to notice, there seems to be a lot larger number of people that actually are saying, "I am in remission. I don't have cancer anymore." Well, in my opinion, a good percentage of those don't even have cancer in the first place. So you know, they're just—it's uh, big, big, big business to uh, to put that chemotherapy through there and. I, this could have been just a misdiagnosis. I mean, it, it, it wasn't a misdiagnosis because uh -huh. they physically took out a tumor okay. that was a certain size. No, no. Oh, um, let me back up. What okay. I mean by misdiagnosis is a mis um, uh, diagnosing or a, a mis prescribing of the of the proper chemotherapy for. So, in other words, there is no doubt that uh, that Merrill had cancer to begin with. That's not what I'm saying. So, and you are correct. That would. I should have said um, a misprescribing of the, the chemotherapy, the type of chemotherapy. Well, it could have been on accident, but in my opinion, they're way too lax. There's so much money to be made with chemotherapy that they really don't, <laughs> they just got, they're getting sloppy. They're throwing it out there. And so be aware. And this is another reason that you want to take a more holistic approach. Go well, ahead. it is very big business. And I have heard that each patient that goes through chemotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, their value is a half a million dollars. Right, and so they look at you as business. dollars. I mean, how could they not? How could they not? I mean, he, he, uh, a builder, every time a new home, a half a million dollar home could be built, he is excited about his new deal. So when a new deal walks through the door and says, I think I might have cancer, can you check? And you check and you think, wow, it kind of looks like it. Let's throw some chemotherapy at it. That'd be $500,000. You don't think the whole system gets excited about it? And I'm not even, I'm, I know it might sound like I'm a little bit jaded, but I'm just saying it's business. It's just business and it's not that I am angry I, I even though I probably should be more angry than I am I'm just saying it is what it is be careful go ahead <clears throat> and you know I don't want to um, overly I don't want to criticize um, the oncologist I had I think he's a, a very good oncologist but they are always walking this line about scaring a mm -hmm. patient mm -hmm. Now, I do think that they are trying to scare you into doing chemotherapy right. because I had to deal with uh, the statistics. And I remember that he had said to me, if you do the chemotherapy, you have a 70% chance of survival. If you do not do anything, you have a 50% chance of survival. So my answer to that was, well, why shouldn't I be in the 50% that survives? Right. So he said, you yeah, really see... Yeah, the glass can be half full. Yes. He said, you, <laughs> he said, you really see the glass is half full. Right. Um, oh, and we do have a statistic going along with that. Uh, uh, DJ, tell us again what the, uh, what the survival rate is. Stage for 4 cancer with mm -hmm. that takes chemotherapy has a 2% survival rate. Okay. So if you have stage 4 cancer, um, you have a two uh, for five over, years. After five, five years, years, only two percent of people are still survivors. So the point is, is that um, there's got to be some better statistics than that. That is the glass ninety-eight percent empty versus fifty percent full. So anyway, continue yes. on. Um, but what I did to arrive at my decision really was to look at the potential side effects, look at the quality of life that was meaningful to me, mm -hmm. and I'm a hiker, so. I, uh, one of the potential side effects was neuropathy. Mm -hmm. And you have to sign uh, about 50 pages of releases so that you will never sue the oncologist for any side effects that you might get from chemotherapy that were not disclosed or that lingered. So there's a tremendous amount of liability with this drug. Wow. And so I took that into consideration that um, I could be compromising the quality of life after the chemotherapy, should I survive. Um, but then when I looked a little deeper, um, my philosophy, because I, I do workshops, I'm a certified life coach and health, uh, life coach and heal your life teacher based on Louise Hay philosophy, for those that know uh, the many writings of Louise Hay, uh, everything is about that well, we, you make decisions, are they love-based? Where are you coming from? From a love-based uh, decision-making process or a fear-based decision-making process? And I knew that I wanted to come from a love-based. And so when I really thought about my body being attacked by uh, the chemotherapy drug, which is so 
it's such a dangerous drug that if you work in the chemotherapy, I've talked to a worker who works in the chemotherapy labs, they have to wear um, top to bottom suits um, because this chemotherapy can, cannot get into any part of a, a, um, a healthy person. That it's really a lethal, lethal drug. So my thought was, you know, the cancer in itself compromised my immune system. Mm -hmm. The chemotherapy drug is designed to attack all cells, healthy cells, potential cancer cells. Mm -hmm. It only can uh, really compromise your immune system further. From a loving standpoint, I wanted to do everything I could to build up my immune system. And that helped me to make the final decision that the most loving thing I could do for my body at this point mm -hmm. would be what were the, all the alternative options I could take advantage of that would build up my immune system so that the cancer did not find, even if it existed there, because we all have cancer cells. Right. So that's I mean, we the were other, just discussing that the other day. We mm -hmm. all have that potential. So I wanted to create the environment that was not friendly mm -hmm. to the cancer cells. So if they were there, actually they are there on, for every um, person, I felt well, they, they must have removed enough, and any cancer cells that remained, I just wanted to create the, uh, an unfriendly environment for them to thrive. Since I am a metaphysical thinker, I am a hypnotherapist, I did a lot of visualization work, mm -hmm. and I also blessed the cancer as a message for me to look at my life overall. What were the things that I needed to change? What things do I need to learn? I, uh, I take that kind of spiritual um, ex challenges to any experiences I have as, what can I learn from this? So I finally found a raw food health coach in Arizona. And I'm going to pause right there because it's time to go to break. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, raw foods. We're going to talk about nutrition and how uh, Meryl was actually able to help beat cancer and how she can help you. If you have cancer, great. She might be able to help you. But also, in anything you do in life uh, where nutrition could help you become more fit, could help clear your mind, help your mind uh, be better, help you uh, get your social life a little bit better, going a little bit better because maybe you get more fit, whatever the case might be. And maybe even your Facebook page will get better because people will relate to these great experiences that you're having. Um, now, if you do want to contact uh, uh, Meryl, you can uh, uh, find her her uh, at merylstanton.com, M-E-R-R-I-L-L -L Stanton, S-T-A-N-T-O-N.com. Is it okay to give your phone over the air? Sure. Okay. Um, you can also reach her at 480-628-8473, and you can ask for Meryl Stanton, um, or you might get the front desk of a holistic health innovation. So um, when we come back, we're going to talk about what all, what does that mean? What do you, uh, if you did get a hold of her, what could she do for you? Uh, again, disclaiming that she's not a medical doctor, but she was able to do amazing things for her that medical doctors were not able to do for her, and it, I think it's worthy of talking about. So don't go away. We'll be right back after the break. This is Kurt Wilhelm, the host of The Social Universe here on World Talk Radio and Voice America. We'll be right back after the break. <laughs> 